Bill Cook is my one of my most favorite people to have. At, what? You can't hear? Is this any better? That's better. Okay. I want to make sure you hear. Um, Bill Cook is one of my favorite speakers here because I met him in Aspen, Colorado. No? Oh, my God. Okay. Better? Okay. I guess, Bill, you might have to hold it. You're loud. Okay. I'm not. I am loud, but I got not loud enough. Anyway, I met Bill Cook years ago in Aspen at the Aspen Institute when he was talking about Florence, Italy. He's probably one of the most knowledgeable people I've met and a stimulating professor. I mean, what everybody should have when they've gone to college. He's it. He's philosophical. He will be more leaning towards the religious compared to the secular. Am I right or wrong, Bill? Am I right? Okay. Um, so, he's worked for 45 years as a teacher, or 42, he wrote for me, in New York, Genesea, or am I saying, a, oh, I did it right, goody. Okay, uh, Genesea College, and what he, and he's written six books. Someone asked me if he's written any books, and I said, I don't know, but I know he was listed as one of the most important professors in, what was it called, the master courses or something? The great course is one of the most popular people that people took his courses. He's a specialist in medieval and Renaissance um, history, and he's been voted as one of the most important in the industry. So Bill, I said, has this religious leanings, and everybody has it, and he decided to create the Bill Cook Foundation. This educates poor children in 30 countries, what is it, 30 countries plus five continents. And he travels to make sure that these kids are in school in Africa and all that. And he raises the money for it. I mean, he's an extraordinary human being. And so the, last year we had the subject on democracy. We are faced in this country with understanding what democracy should be. And so I asked him to talk about justice, because that's a major subject now that people are worried about. What is justice? So he will take it from the beginning of Aristotle and Plato to the Old Testament, the New Testament. And then, please, this is a discussion group. If you don't agree with him, say your opinion. If you do, we're interested in you guys talking. Please, just so you may disagree, but don't be disagreeable, okay? So, Bill Cook. Let me give you my first preliminary warning. You can see the title is What is Justice? At the end, you're not going to know the answer. So, if we're really doing well, you're going to be able to think about it perhaps a little, more diff a little bit differently, a little bit more broadly than you have before. But this is about how we ask questions and how we hunt for ways to deal with those questions rather than coming to the final solution. And therefore, I hope that at the end, we will, either in small groups or with all of us, find ways to talk about this most important subject. Let me remind you, since last time I talked about American democracy, let's start here. And one of the most common things we do as Americans is say the Pledge of Allegiance, right? Let me just remind you what the last part of it says, especially because the man who wrote it grew up five miles from where I live in western New York. It is, right, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Right? We're for that, right? Well, I think probably most of us can sort of nod and say, I think I've got a pretty good, pretty good take on what liberty is. We may disagree on certain things, but the country in general values liberty and has, I think, still some 
idea of the commonality of the meaning of that word liberty. But justice is tougher. It's harder to pin that down. And we know that the way you do that is something other than going to a dictionary. I did your homework for you last night, so I went to the dictionary to see what it says about justice. I'm going to give you a definition from dictionary.com. There are two definitions you'll be happy to know here. One is the quality of being just, and the other is righteousness. Okay. Then I looked up righteousness, and the definition is the quality of being righteous and just. So dictionaries are not the place to go if we want to say, my God, what is justice? And yet, again, I want to start out as Americans. Think about what the preamble to the Constitution says. Let me remind you of it. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, ready, number one, establish justice. That's the first job of government, it says in our Constitution. Establish justice. And then listen to the rest of the list. Ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty. And as I've been reading that lately, I sort of came to believe, especially given what I know about the education of those who wrote the Constitution, that when it says establish justice, these other things follow from it, and without justice, they can't possibly come to be. So if we believe that the most essential issue in government is to establish justice, we ought to be able to know and talk intelligently about what exactly justice is. So that's the topic I want to take up today. So let me suggest that today, very often, when we hear the word justice, it's preceded by an adjective. We have social justice, economic justice, environmental justice, racial justice, and all of those things. And it's important that we talk about those and many other kinds of justice. But the adjectives don't get us closer to the essential meaning of justice. Because presumably all those kinds of justice we live have something in common. That is to say they have in common justice. And so if we're going to work in any of those areas or the many others I didn't name, we really ought to have a sense of what we mean when we talk about justice. And by golly, it's hard. So what I want to do is take you back to your halcyon days of college when the curriculum for many of you, for most of you probably, was at least in some ways based on one of two general education models. One was the model from the University of Chicago, and it was a great books course, and the other was a model from Columbia, which was called the History of Contemporary Civilization. I had the second version when I was a freshman at Wabash College in Crawfordsville, Indiana, all oh, these almost 60 years ago. But as we think back, what we learned in those kinds of courses is, first of all, our culture, Western culture as we think of it, is some sort of combination of the tradition of the ancient Greeks and Romans, the classical tradition, and the tradition handed down by the Jews and early Christians, the Judeo-Christian tradition. And what we learned is, in certain ways, those things were sort of blended together. Oh, a few other things come in here and there. But that's the basic way we looked at it. Now, I want to suggest, in one sense, that's a little bit too easy. Because we know now that there are, in fact, many, many ingredients other than those ancient peoples, whether it's in Israel or whether it's in the northern part of the Mediterranean. Influence of Slavic people, Germanic people, influences from Africa and Asia, and not just in recent times, but a long time ago. For example, uh, the kind of math we all had to struggle with in high school was algebra. You ever think about the fact algebra is a, in this, a, an Arabic word, and therefore it Algebra, that way of doing mathematics, that kind of mathematics, came to the West via the Muslims, who, by the way, borrowed it from the Hindus. So even Western civilization is a lot more complicated than we probably learned 
again, for me now, almost 60 years ago. But still, today, I want to go back to those two basic building blocks. The Greeks and Romans, here I'm going to focus on the Greeks, and the Hebrews and the Christians, where I'm going to talk about both the Hebrew Bible, which Christians call the Old Testament, and the Christian Bible, that is to say, the New Testament. And so if we take a look at these two most fundamental streams that have flowed into some Western ideas about justice and many other things, maybe that will be a way for us to get started a little bit in trying to understand what justice is. And so when we're doing philosophy and when we're talking about justice, everything begins with Plato. Probably almost all of you read or had your, or you were told about when you were in college Plato's Republic, or at least the famous allegory of the cave, which I'll talk about in a minute. I don't know about you, but I didn't pay much attention sometimes in class, but boy, that allegory of the cave sort of got, got to me. But anyway, we need to realize that, first of all, Plato claims to be recording, although he's really creating, conversations between himself I'm sorry, not between himself, but with Socrates and Socrates' friend. I now want to press a button to make a picture appear, and I have no idea how to do that because I don't see anything to press. Does anybody know how to tell me how to press something? There, look at that. Ah. Uh, uh, you, you can imagine if all of our four-year-old grandchildren were here, right? They'd all race over and fight for it, but it's a different world. This is Plato. By the way, I'm going to show you pictures of three Greek guys, and they all sort of look alike. Uh, don't let that put you off too much. But Plato tends to, claims to be recording the conversations that Socrates had. Socrates dies in 399 BC, Plato about 50 years later. And different dialogues, because that's what they are, of Plato talk about different topics. There's one about beauty, there's one about love, and so on and so forth. But the Republic is about justice, and it's the longest one. And it's one of those things that if you went to a college with any kind of traditional liberal arts education, whether you did the assignment or not, I don't know. That you were assigned a piece of Plato, I'm willing to bet my life. So I want to go there because the Republic is such an important thing. And let me sort of set it because unlike most philosophy, it's written as a story. It's written as a conversation. You can make it a play if you will. So Socrates is at the, at the seaport of Athens called Piraeus. He'd been, to a, he'd been basically to a festival. He's walking back, and the servant of a friend of his grabs him and says, your friend wants you to come back and wants you to come and spend some time with him. Don't go home. Come with me. So they do what they say and go back and start a conversation. And pretty soon, from the conversation, so, hi, how are you? Hey, Socrates, I know you're getting old. How do you feel about that? You know, that kind of conversation. You might have had one of those. I get it all the time. But at any rate, after a little bit of small talk, finally they come to a question of justice. And here is the question. What is it? And as you might imagine, in sort of a friendly sort of dinner conversation over wine, lots of people think they have the answer. So one of them speaks up and says, I know what justice is. Justice is telling the truth and paying your debts. And you can imagine a lot of people around the table sort of nodding. That sounds pretty good, right? Telling the truth and paying your debts. Well, Socrates at a dinner party can kind of be a pain in the butt because he's not going to let that one go. And Socrates says, I'm sorry, but there are problems with that. And the first problem is this problem, OK? Let's talk about telling the truth. Let's talk about paying your debts. If, and I'm going to modernize some of the things he says so it makes more sense to us, perhaps. Let's say that you were living in Germany in 1942, and you were hiding Jews in the basement. And the Nazi soldier comes to the door and says, do you have any Jews here? It would never be just to tell the truth. The just thing is to lie. So it may be that most of the time telling the truth is just, but it can't be a definition because it's too easy to find exceptions. Paying your debts. 
This is the one that Socrates actually used. Let's say that you are holding some weapons that belong to a friend of yours. He just asked you to keep them for him. And he comes in one night, and he's angry as hell, and says, give me my spear. I'm going to go stab that son of a bitch to death. Again, I'm sort of putting this in more modern language. Well, you owe him his spear because it's his spear. Seeing how aggravated he is, it wouldn't be just to give him his spear. So most of the time, paying your debts is the just thing. Most of the time, telling the truth is the just thing. Socrates admits that. But it's not a definition of justice because definitions can't have exceptions. So where do we go from here? Well, pretty soon, people come up with other definitions of justice. So for example, how is, how is this? Let's say that justice is giving everybody what is owed them. And that can be material good, but it can also be treatment and so on. It's giving everybody what is owed to them. Well, pretty soon, the question is then, doesn't that mean if I gave everybody what owe them, I do nice things for my friends and bad things to my enemies? There's some problems with that. Here's one problem, OK? Do you know who your enemies are, really? Here's somebody who's trying to, we might say in today's language, do some tough love with you. And you say, that person's hurting me. That person's attacking me. That person is not my friend. He doesn't deserve me to do any good to him. So how do we know who really is trying to do good things for us and who is trying to hurt us? So we never can know that for sure, perhaps. But very often, what's going to happen is we harm somebody, we give them what we think is due, we harm somebody because they think we think they're trying to harm us, but in fact they're trying to help us. We all know people that at one time we wondered, why are they doing this to me? Why are they telling me this stuff? And at some point you realize, for my own good. So this, this definition doesn't really allow for that. And then Socrates says there's even a bigger problem. Is it ever just to do harm to anyone? Because doing them harm means they're worse than they were before. Can harming someone and making him or her worse ever be counted as just, no matter what those people did to you? Well, the conversation sort of breaks down. You know, again, you're having a nice, pleasant dinner party. Somebody throws this justice thing up during the fourth course, and you think, well, we'll get to that, and then we'll talk about, you know, things that, are, that matter, like you know, football scores and stuff. But this group of people gets carried away with this and say, wait a minute, first definition didn't work. This thing, doing what's owed them, which means ultimately doing good for your friends and bad for your enemies, that doesn't work. Let's try another one. And somebody says, look, you guys are all sort of sitting around being namby-pamby. Let's just say what justice is. We all know what it really is. Justice is the advantage of the stronger. Let me put that in modern English. Might makes right. OK? Might makes right. And let's talk about that now for a minute with regard to government, Socrates says. If might makes right, that is to say, if the rulers are by definition just because they're the rulers, then there's absolutely no possibility of dissenting from the government. That doesn't sound like justice to me. And so Socrates goes through these various things that, for different reasons, sort of sound right. Again, paying the, you know, telling the truth and paying your debts, gosh, that just, that sounds just to me. Giving people what's owed them, that sounded just to me might make right, well, I might not be comfortable with it, but isn't that just the way the world is? And therefore, shouldn't we use that sort of statement that seems to cover a lot of reality rather than fiddling for something more complicated or more intellectual or more abstract? And this is all very frustrating to Socrates. 
And we go through this on and on and on. And this is what bothers Socrates. Says, you know, if, if the advantage of the strong is justice, then what the weak try to do is injustice. Right? Because they're sort of opposed by the strong, and the strong are right because they have the might. And therefore, you have, again, this impossibility of dissent. And you know what a lot of people are going to say? I would rather have injustice. I'd rather stand for myself than pay attention and do what the government says. If the government, you claim, is just and therefore always right, I don't want to be just. I don't want to be just. And so after hours, it seems, which means about 50 pages, of having this discussion, they just aren't getting anywhere. And this is a very important point because talking about things like justice is hard. It's not like talking about whether the Buffalo Bills were a good football team. Sorry, that's my local prejudice there. It's not like talking about whether we heard a beautiful concert last night. It's really hard. And there are going to be differing opinions that come at it from very different angles, and yet everybody would say they believe in justice. And they want to live a just life. So where do we go? Well, how about this? We're trying to find justice in the individual. Me, you. Let's sort of stand back and see if we can find where justice is in a whole community, a state, or what the Greeks lived in, city-states like Athens or Sparta or Corinth or whatever. So when you do that, you got to go back to the beginning. right? Everybody says that all historians ultimately want to start everything they say in the Garden of Eden and work forward. we got to go back to the beginning. So let's go back to the beginning and ask why there even are organizations like states. And the simple answer is because we aren't self-sufficient. If you relied on my garden, you'd all starve to death. I, I have, I'm, I'm one of the classic, you know, have a bad thumb. I don't have a green thumb. And other people don't have every, any, all the things they need to live well. And so what we do is we form communities. And we sort of divide up things, and people do what they're good at. Or at least they should, Socrates says. So what does that mean? What are people good at? Well, let's talk about the major things that have to be done. First of all, we need somebody in charge. Somebody or some bodies. We don't necessarily mean a monarchy. We need people in charge. And we need people to defend us because there's another town over there and they might want some of the fields that we have to grow food for them. And then we need workers. All kinds of workers, whether that's farmers or builders or whatever it is, so we can kind of divide things into three parts. And in a just city, those who have the skills to rule, rule, those who have the skills to soldier, soldier, and those who have the skills to work, work. And it's a cooperation so that the parts of the whole all function in harmony. Well, all this sounds really good, but where is justice? We haven't even used the word justice in describing all of these things. And so we say, well, maybe people as individuals are sort of like cities. They're sort of cities in miniature, or put it the other way, cities are, are the large picture of what's in an individual. We have an intellect. We have what he calls a spirited part, sort of ready to fight for us. And we have a part that does the task we all need to do simply to survive. So there are these three parts of us as there are three parts to the city. We're drawing analogies here. Again, getting to justice is hard, and you can't do it at the first conversation at the dinner table. And we've tried several different definitions, people sort of shouting them out in the room, and that didn't work. So we're taking the circuitous route. So 
we've got this analogy between the state and the individual. So first, where is justice in the state? Then maybe we can come back to one last analogy to figure out what it means for an individual to be just. Well, Socrates says, for a state to be just, the people who have the skills to lead, lead, the people who have the skills of soldiering, soldier, and the people who have the skills of working, work. Sounds pretty simple. So what's justice? Right? That's what we're looking for. Justice is when all the people cooperate doing what they're good at for the good of the whole. Or it's the harmony of the parts of the city. So how about in an individual human being? Justice is living in a way where the intellect is in charge, where you have a spirited part that defends you physically and otherwise, and you've got a part of you that has to do the practical things day to day to stay alive. And justice is in the individual, the harmony of what he calls the parts of the soul. This all sounds kind of interesting. Except, of course, if somebody ever asks you now, is such and such a particular thing just, we haven't gotten any answer to that at all yet. What we're trying to do is find an answer in principle as to what justice is. Well, so let me suggest that we take also a look at the fact that in this city that Plato has created, and for this individual, we need education. I want to go to the next image, whoever is my image person. We're going to do two quick ones here, OK? OK. The, the first two are just Plato and Socrates. Let me go to the next one. This is Aristotle. Let me go to the next one. There. All right, let's hold on that. We have two different versions of this. Put the wrong one up. Never mind. We can go without that. We always have, we always have setbacks. So what we, what we want to do is to take a look at where we go with education. Because you can't be just without education. You've got to be self-aware. You need to develop what intellect you have. You need to be able to be strong and defend yourself. And you need to be able to do the things you do. And that takes education. And you may recall, because probably this little piece of Plato was assigned to you, even if you don't remember it, the allegory of the cave, where Socrates says, the problem is we are all like people in a cave. And let me describe it to you, he says. People are sitting tied up so they can only see toward the back of the cave. And therefore, the only thing that changes is the fact that behind them, there are people, this is really weird, he says, carrying statues of things. And there's a fire behind them. So the fire projects the images of the statues on the back of the cave. A statue of a human, a statue of a dog, whatever it is. So what you're seeing is a copy of a copy of reality. That is saying you see the image of a statue of, say, a human being. And of course, you think that shadow you see is really a human being because you don't know any better. Now imagine, he says, one day, if somebody gets loose from being tied up in the cave, and they turn around, and they can see way in the distance the entrance to the cave. And so there's light there, but the light hurts your eyes because you aren't used to it. You're used to the light of, of the fire. And your first response is, I don't want to go there. It hurts. You know where this is going, right? Education hurts. It shakes up the things you're taught by your parents or you have intuited yourself because many of those things may not be right. So imagine, Socrates says, that you decide finally your eyes are a little bit used to that light and you start to go out of the cave. And you're alone, and it's difficult, and it's painful. And you get outside the cave, and all you can do is look down at the ground because of the light. It's too bright. Finally, you can look ahead. 
And at some point, you can see the light of the sun. Now, what do you want to do? You want to go back in the cave and tell everybody what you're looking at isn't real. And you go back in the cave and you say, let me tell you what it's like out there, folks, what reality is. And nobody believes you. And you've ruined their comfort level. And they're angry with you. That's what education does. <laughs> education is getting out of the cave with the responsibility to go back into the cave and to explain to people who are yet unenlightened what reality is. But notice, education is painful. I mean, we all remember you know, fraternity and sorority parties and all that sort of stuff, and every now and then we studied. You know, that's why we remember college. Remember, it hurt. It not just hurt because you had to stay up all night for an exam. It hurt because your teacher told you things that at least you, you understood, going against what your parents have said, against what your religion says, maybe even against what your government says. And that hurts. You don't know how to deal with that. And you're in this quandary. Who, how do I know what's right? Education is hard and painful, but necessary. Necessary for the leaders of the state in particular, but also if you're going to be guided in life by your intellect, you need that education, and you've got to find your way out of the cave. So this is very scary stuff. And as we look at it all, you say, yeah, this is sort of interesting and challenging, but again, I still don't know how I should treat my neighbor tomorrow when she comes over and annoys the hell out of me. Now, we haven't gotten to that. And Plato really never does get us to that. Plato and Socrates are really quite obscure and quite theoretical. So what I'm going to do is cheat a little bit and say that we want to turn for a minute to Plato's best student, Aristotle, who often disagreed with him. That's what students are supposed to do with their teachers, right? You're supposed to challenge your teachers. You're supposed to disagree. You're supposed to say, boy, he's a great teacher, but he sure missed the point of this, right? I need a poof there. OK. I'm actually going to look at this painting now. Some of you probably know this painting. <laughs> Raphael. by the great Raphael and it's called the School of Athens and it's in the Vatican right? in the middle are Plato and Aristotle Plato's over here, the old guy with the beard the, the, the darker beard is Aristotle I want to do the next picture to show you what that detail is I want you to look Plato is pointing up Aristotle is gesturing down Plato is a great theorist Aristotle, I heard a scholar say, is the philosopher of common sense. So maybe if Plato was the most brilliant guy ever, maybe we need Aristotle to help us put it into a framework that we can understand and be practical. And Aristotle wrote a book called The Politics. And it's an interesting book. And I want to talk just a minute about it because one of the questions that's raised is, and here we're going to change the topic a little bit, then I'm going to draw an analogy, trust me on this one, okay, about wisdom. Aristotle says, how do you know who a wise man is? Now, Plato would have given you an answer that, you know, you'd have been back at that dinner discussion. Plato said, as Aristotle said, let's be practical. There are just some people, you all know some, where you look at them and say, these are wise people. You don't necessarily agree with them all the time. But here's somebody who lives well and wisely. That doesn't mean they're good at everything. The person who's wise in your mind might not have gone to college, might be a truck driver, but this person just knows how to live well. May not be able to balance a checkbook. May not be able to tell you what planet Plato and Aristotle grew up on, but they live their lives well. And so to find a wise man, you're not looking for specific skills. Can he keep his bank account? You're looking for the general quality of living. 
And I bet if you think back in your life, you can all point to somebody. And it may be a teacher, it, but it also may be a gardener you had with a sixth grade education. Many, many years ago, I gave the commencement address at my university. And so one of the things I decided to do was announce the wisest person I had met in my years at the university. He was a man who was the father of a student of mine who had committed suicide. He had a high school diploma. He was a school bus driver. And when I met with him, he said, let me tell you what I want to do. I want to meet with your administration because I believe that they didn't see some signs they should have seen in the behavior of my son. And I want to talk to the administrators because I want them to change their policy because I don't want any other person to go through what I've gone through. That's a wise man to me. Doesn't matter whether he has a diploma. Doesn't matter whether, whether he's ever heard of Plato. He lives wisely, and we want to look and see what is it about that person I can imitate. We can't imitate that person directly because we're good at things they're bad at and vice versa. We have different interests. We live in different cultures. But nevertheless, we want to look in general for a person we can describe as wise. And I would argue that if we can analogize, analogize from what, Plato, what Aristotle says and say, Maybe we ought to think about, instead of simply talking about the abstraction of justice, think about people you'd look at throughout your whole lives, both personally and in the news and whatever, and say, or maybe even a fictional character, and say, who are the most just people I've encountered? And what is it about them that they have in common? They don't have the same skills. They don't live in the same places. They don't vote for the same candidates, necessarily. It, but what is it they have? Because that's what I'm going after. Aristotle is much more practical than Plato. But the real practical people, i got to tell you, are the Jews and the Christians. You sort of say Plato doesn't say you do this, 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 and you can't do that. Let's go to the Old Testament for a minute. Talk about a place of do's and don'ts. Right? In the first five books, of the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew Scripture, the Torah, the Pentateuch, whatever, whatever term you want to use to call it, there are no fewer than 613 laws. We know there's the Big Ten. There are 613 laws in the Torah. Let me have the next picture. This is a medieval painting, but you can see here God handing Moses the Ten Commandments. The first five books are also called the five books of Moses. He is the, ma the main character of four of the five books of Hebrew Scripture. And there's so many do's and don'ts. And people read them today, although re really only a fraction, like the Ten Commandments, for example, or certain other passages that people may point you to. But although there are all these do's and don'ts, in other words, the God of the Hebrews is very specific. There are three sets of laws about how you treat slaves in those 613 laws. There are all kinds of dietary laws. There are ritual laws, and so on and so forth. Clothing laws. So we have sort of an opposite because, as Psalm 4 says, God is a God of justice. When you answer me, O God of justice, the fourth psalm begins. So this God of justice has lots of do's and don'ts. Hundreds of them, literally. And I think for a lot of people today, whether you're religious or not, whether you're a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim or no religion or a different religion, they're very hard to deal with, and many of them seem largely irrelevant. Slave laws don't have a lot of practical use today just as one example. So we have this very legal sense of what it means to be justice in the first five books of Hebrew scripture. But what I want to do is now turn to the part of the Old Testament that I think is most important to us, which is the prophetic books. And I want to begin with the prophet Amos. Amos is the oldest of the prophets. He lived in the 8th century. And I want to read a passage from Amos, a very short one, 
because he says something very important. He sort of tells us, in a sense, what justice is. That'll be handy. So Amos says this. Remember, he's talking about this legal tradition now. He says, alas for you who desire the day of the Lord. What do you want the day? What do you want? Why do you want the day of the Lord? And he goes on to say, I hate, I despise festivals, all of which are prescribed by the law. And I take no delight in your solemn assemblies, all the formal rituals, even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, which are prescribed in the law, I will not accept them. This is God speaking. And then God says what he wants you to know. This is Amos 5, 24. But let justice roll down like a river, and righteousness, an, a an adjective that means something similar to justice, like an everlasting stream. By the way, that is the most quoted passage in the Bible by a pretty good preacher and theologian named Martin Luther King. He quotes Amos 5.24 more than any other passage in Scripture. And let's listen to the two parts of it. Let justice roll like a river. What he's doing here is saying, we tend to think of it like a pond. It just sort of sits there, and we dip into it when we need it. No, it's not like a pond. It's like a river. A river moves, and it moves all the time, and it's going somewhere. And righteousness, like an everlasting stream. If you've been to Israel, unless you've been there in the wintertime, you know that it's a lot of very dry gullies. But when the snows from the mountains melt in the spring, water rushes down. But only for a brief time. Then they're dry for the rest of the year until next year when the snow rises. That's not justice. Justice is like an everlasting stream. You don't do justice today and say, gee, I think I've done my amount of justice today. I'll, I'll, I'll think about it next time, maybe in th on Thursday. Let justice roll like a river. It's got to move. And it's got to be all the time like an everlasting stream. But the guy who really takes us to all this is the prophet Isaiah. And I want to turn to what Isaiah has to say because he has some very interesting things to say. He starts out with the same kind of, I don't want all your rituals, I don't want all the smoke, I don't want all the animals, and so on. And then he says, let me tell you what I want. You, well, let me pick it up here. Wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doing from before my eyes. Cease to be evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphans. Plead for the widows. Wow. That seems to be pretty clear. Those are examples, but they're the three examples he chooses. And let's talk about why he chooses those three things. The oppressed, because, of course, the oppressed are, by definition, not given an equal chance. When oppressed people go to court, they usually lose, at least in the culture Isaiah is talking about. Defend the orphan and take care of the widow. Why? Because in Jewish law at that time, widows and orphans have no legal standing. In other words, they couldn't go to court on their own behalf. Only men could go to court. And so these are the weakest people in the society. If you can't go to court, you're pretty weak. This is about taking care of the weak and the oppressed. And that's the way Isaiah talks about justice. Do Justice, do those things. And then a little bit later, he goes on and on about people who don't do that. Ah, you who join house to house, who add field to field until there is room for no one but yourself. And you who, who are left to live alone in the midst of the land, the Lord of hosts has sworn in my, in my hearing, surely, Many houses shall be left desolate, large and beautiful houses without inhabitants. 
those who are, are gifted with many things have responsibilities. He doesn't list those responsibilities here. But the theme that we see in Isaiah and Amos are fairly clear. And they have examples. If there's an orphan, it doesn't say feed the orphan, it says defend the orphan. That means more than feeding. Because people who have power need to work for the powerless. This is a very different approach to justice. This is a list of things to check off. And these are very specific examples of what to do. And we get the same thing in Christian scripture. I'm going to look at a couple passages that I think you will find interesting. Let's take a look, for example, at a passage in Matthew where the leaders of the Jews, of course, Jesus is a Jew too, but this is the way Matthew puts it, are questioning Jesus. And here's the question. Okay, Jesus, you got 613 laws. Which is the greatest? Of course, this is a trap. Whatever Jesus says, they're going to come back at him. So it's a trap. What is the greatest of the laws? And Jesus says, well, actually, I'm going to give you two. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the most important laws. Now, in Matthew, he doesn't carry through with that story. But in Luke, who retells it, when that happens, then one of the Jews comes back and says to Jesus, okay, you said love God and love neighbor. Okay, who's my neighbor? Whew, pretty good question. And he tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. Here's this Jewish guy being robbed, the Levite, a kind of member of what we would call the clergy, and a rabbi passed by. And somebody from this hated sect of Samaritans takes care of this man. So, of course, at the end, Jesus asked, which one of those people who saw him on the road was his neighbor? This is a pretty radical answer. And so we have a different approach here. And toward the end of Matthew, there's a very, very interesting passage. Matthew has five speeches of Jesus. The first one is the Sermon on the Mount, for example. And I want to look at a passage of the last sermon Jesus gives. It's in Matthew chapter 25. And it's called the Parable of Judgment. It is the parable of justice, if you will. And Jesus says this. Come, you that are blessed by the Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. And it goes on and on and on like that. What we today call the corporal works of mercy, to feed the hungry, to cleanse, the, you know, the, to, to, to cleanse people, to go visit them in jail, to give them food, to give them clothes, all the rest of it. And then he says, of course, in so much as you have done it to one of these the least, you've done it for me. God wants people out, according to Matthew and his version of Jesus, he thinks that justice, what's going to get you into the bosom of Abraham rather than thrown out into hell, is that you've done those, what we call, again, call the corporal, the bodily works of mercy. It's a kind of get down and dirty justice. So opposite from what Plato does. Like Plato never gets down in the trenches and say, by the way, if you happen to pass an old lady limping along, you do this or that, and that's justice. Plato never does that. What I want to argue is that both of these two sources, the biblical source, which is Jewish and Christian, and the ancient source, in this case the Greeks, they're both important for us. Too often, I think, you get philosophers that are up in the clouds, or you get people who are simply out in the street all day handing out a piece of food to somebody. But think if you can bring those two things there to think, to think and argue and debate and try to figure out how we can talk about justice. And the better we can do that, the better we can practice it, whether you belong to any of these religions or not. And that's what I want to propose. Doing justice is hard. Again, there is no answer 
to the question, what is justice, from, that I have anyway. The closest I can come to an answer is, think about it. And think about it intelligently. Discuss it with people. Argue about it. Reject bad definitions. Try to come up with a better one. And then, don't do that totally separate from what you do in the rest of your lives when you're not sitting around and debating. But get out and do justice. This is not about thinking or doing. This is about thinking and doing. And if we have both pieces to work with, we don't just have a list of good deeds, and we don't just have a theoretical definition. If we struggle with one and go out and try to do the other the best we can, using our own skills and values and resources and whatever, then perhaps we can come closer to being what I think everybody wants to be, a just person. So no answers, just some thoughts. And I hope it helps, and I hope people walk out discussing it, arguing it, debating it, and also thinking, what do I do tomorrow to be a practitioner of justice that I didn't do today? If so, that would be wonderful. And we do have some time, and I know Dale wants to have some discussion. Questions, discussion among yourselves. Leave me out of it if you want. I have a mic here. I'm going to walk around with Bill. Did any of the drafters of the Constitution attempt to define justice? No, they don't define it, but they, they really don't. Uh, obviously, there's more discussion of it in the Federalist Papers by some of them. But what I would say is we know enough about their education to know that virtually, not quite, virtually all of them were Christians. John Adams was a, was a Unitarian. There was one Jewish signer of the Declaration of Independence, for example. But basically, they were raised in a Christian environment and were church-going folks. And the great, great majority of them, whether it was at Harvard or Princeton or William and Mary, they were the big suppliers, and Columbia, suppliers to that generation of leaders in America, they all read this stuff because the university curricula in those days were based on the classics. And not only that, they probably read them in Greek. Sort of scary. So we know about their education and we know about their religious practices. So we know that they're familiar with these things. Of course, a lot of the Constitution, those, a lot of people who voted on the Constitution, we know very little about them. Uh, they didn't write like some did in the Federalist Papers and in other places. But we do know that they had the, the, the tools I'm talking about, they had in their tool chest. And that they, are, they were conscious of that. I mean, there, there are times when they make specific references in some of the debates and in some of the writing afterwards about certain passages of the Greek classics, whether it's Plato or whether it's Cicero in the Latin tradition or others. So we know that they, they had these tools, and we know that they used them. And they were talking to other people in the House of Burgesses or the US Congress, to other people who also had that tool set. And therefore, there was at least a kind of unity of, we might say, academic and spiritual experience, although it was expressed differently, different kinds of Christians, a few Catholics, lots of Anglicans, but there were also Baptists and Methodists and others as well. So I, I would say what I would argue is that there are places where it seems we can sort of see that common toolkit being used. And there are ways when we can see things that don't have to be spelled out because they know the other people they're talking to know what they're talking about. But I, that's, that's how I would define what we know about the, those folks who wrote the Constitution. Oh, sorry. Hi. Uh, welcome back. Thank you. Um, maybe at the end of your answer, uh, I'd like you to know, tell me or tell us who was the Jewish signer. Because I know there was a Catholic <laughs> signer. And there's lots of murmuring around here. The Catholic signer for all Catholics in the audience was John Carroll of Maryland, Catholic signer of the Declaration. I don't know who. The Jew John Carroll of Maryland. Maryland was a Catholic colony. We can argue which Queen Mary it's named for, Mary the First or the Virgin Mary. But, uh, uh, but as to the Jewish signer, uh, who was it? I just don't, I just all right. don't remember. All right, all right. One of those things I know but don't all right. My question, though, my, my comment, though, if you, if you find out, tell me, because okay. it would, it would uh, yeah. all right. Um, the answer to the question, I think, when I talk we, we, a lot, we talked about justice and, and the rest and the framers. Um, 
I think the best place to go would be Washington's farewell address. Interesting, he was the least educated of the framers. He had a surveying license at the University of uh, Virginia, or excuse me, that was Jefferson's place, uh, William and Mary, which is the only place to have gotten certified then. Um, but he had um, uh, Hamilton and, and particularly Madison, who were both, oh, the other way, Madison and particularly Hamilton uh, with the farewell address. Now, unfortunately, this is always cited as uh, an isolationist defense that we should stay out of foreign wars. Uh, well, the foreign wars were here. The French were still in, 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 in uh, Louisiana to Mr. Jefferson. The Spanish were still in Florida. The Brits had a good part of that. So it wasn't, it wasn't only isolationist. It was like, right. you know, you get involved with them, they're going to eat us alive. We're thir only 13 little colonies. But most of the speech is that if you believe in these freedoms that we just signed eight years before I was you know, go when I became president, uh, only a just people can preserve liberty and freedom. We didn't give you licentiousness. We gave you obligations as well. We gave you accountability. We gave you courts. Uh, and if you stray from that, uh, you're going to lose democracy. The other place, and I was going to think of this, um, as you were quoting the lines from Amos, um, my mind went right to Lincoln's second inaugural, uh, one of the shortest inaugurals you'll ever see from a president. But uh, the first half is not gloating. He just won the war, after all. The Union is preserved, we think. Well, we don't know. And even now, we don't know. Uh, but he talks about slavery. and. It's easy to attack the South, but he says that uh, both sides engaged in it, both sides bled for it, the original sin on this continent. And after three or four paragraphs of that, he ends with the malice toward none, where he talks about uh, c caring for the widow and the orphan who bore the burden of the war. So I just want to throw it back, and I thought the two places I'd go, and then maybe you can comment on those, com those speeches if you like. And, and, yeah. and that's exactly right. Let me suggest a couple things. Uh, I recently read a book about the sort of education of the founders, and one of the points of it is Washington was one of the least educated. But, I mean, if you think about that in terms of how do you find a just person, he was pretty good at figuring out who to listen to and understanding that there were expertises that he didn't have. And that even though he was the boss, he nevertheless was was aware of who he was in terms of much more educated people. I mean, intellectually, he couldn't hold a candle to a Jefferson or whatever. But it seems to me the good thing is he sort of knew that. And he also knew what he had that Jefferson didn't have, I think. And that there was, there was that sense that I think, you know, if we were looking at the founding fathers and saying, pick out perhaps the most just one. Now, all of these are problematic because they lived a long time ago and values were different. But I don't know, Washington would sort of rise to the top for me. Even though there are people better educated and probably intellectually more gifted, I think probably I would go with Washington. And of course, Lincoln was largely self-taught, uh, as we know. I mean, he had, he, had, he had law practice, but he didn't go to university. He was not the guy that was going up to William and Mary or Princeton or Harvard or Yale or whatever. And I think, I think so often we tend to equate, you know, sort of just and wise with smart and successful. I think we have to be very careful about doing that. And we know there are some wise people who fail, fail badly. Um, and I think that knowing, trying to figure out what justice is and doing justice is not a formula for success. It's a formula for truth. And if you're religious, it's a formula, I suppose, for getting to heaven. But even if you aren't, uh, we need to know that justice is something you have to do for its own sake, rather than for the sake of benefits that come from it. And I think the wisest of folks, whether that's a Plato or a Washington or whatever, recognize that, that justice is an end and not a means to achieve something else, like fame or fortune or, other, or high office, or other sorts of things. It's something to be used, not something to tattoo on your chest. I am a just guy. So I think it's important for us to think in those ways. And that's very, those comments are very helpful in getting us to do that, I think. Excuse me, um, Alexander Hamilton. Wait, we got, we got, we got a microphone. Alexander Hamilton. Inside the Declaration. Yeah. So it says, well, inside the Constitution.
birthplace, and we haven't lived in that way since so seeing the Hamilton. There are some references to it, um, and they argue about it in the book, so I'll leave it from there. I, uh, if I could reflect what you were saying over here. Hello, Bill. Always love your presentations. Thank you. You know, in that kind of dichotomy you mentioned between the, I guess, reason versus, you know, what, what man can do is how I take that. And then on the other hand, what God says we should do, our faith, revelation. You know, I think it's, I think it's personified by um, maybe Alex, I think maybe the, the lady was saying something to this effect, too, that Alexander Hamilton had quite an intellect, you know, that was even in the most recent musical really showed how clever he was and could match wits with with the other founders. Um, on, the flip, uh, on the flip side, I think of Lincoln and Washington, and I'm reflecting what he said over there, but he's not listening to me right now. He's laughing at me. But uh, <laughs> Alvin. I think the two people you brought up, Alvin, the two people you brought up, Al, I think both of them had a firm reliance and uh, knew scripture very well. Both Washington, you know, where he, where he lacked in his maybe uh, Greek intellect, uh, he, he, he knew to rely on, I think he called God providence most uh, frequently. And then Lincoln, of course, knew the Bible uh, intimately, right. growing up on, the, I guess, chopping wood. So I don't know if you wanted to speak any more on that, but it kind of, yeah. it, it seems like that yeah. what you brought up, Alvin, yeah. and... What Bill is saying, it, it kind of epitomizes some of that. I don't know if that's indeed the, the case about Hamilton being the most clever. Did you? I mean, I don't know if you buy that. I, I mean, he was clever, but he but he also didn't know Montesquieu. He didn't know Locke like you know the uh, uh, Jefferson and uh, Madison did. I, I'm just pitching that out there. Right. Uh, but I would go back to Washington in the sense of I don't think he read any of those. Right. Right. Uh, he picked it up from his staff. He had the best cabinet in history. And there are only five people in it, and four people in it, but it's still the best cabinet. Uh, and he used people well. But what's interesting to your last point, um, Washington's, the only life Washington is extremely interesting. He wasn't born with, uh, with powdered wig hair, he wasn't born with wooden heat, uh, which is all you learn in second grade in the picture of the dollar bill. You know? uh, in a way, you know, he was a fatherless child, and was supposed to inherit anything. Uh, he got Mount Vernon because his older brother died with tuberculosis rules of the society, which Jefferson fixed for primogeniture, the eldest son had it all. You could not pull your property until you wish. So that was number one. He never had any of that. So he thought he'd become a soldier, a way of supporting himself. And the young Washington was quite wild until he almost got himself killed. Talk about justice. And he realized that he might have been spared for a reason. He lacked that wide ring and held the of that and fell. Many years later, he was shot, I was shot. You know, the Bible says, of uh, course, for 10 years, actually, we left the pulpit. In any event, uh, we're here. So after 70, the rest of our days are going to serve God. I'll mention this because after Washington was shot, he tends to spend a little more time reading the Bible. And he becomes a vestryman of uh, Christ Church in, in Alexandria, where uh, Roosevelt took Winston Churchill after Pearl Harbor. Just Washington's pew is not going to be moved. Uh, uh, Churchill wanted to see the pew. Well, Roosevelt took him there, and Washington was a vestryman. When he becomes a vestryman, he really begins to argue with himself about slavery. And how can this exist? Well, what can I do about it? He spent the rest of his life trying to figure out how you make burden, not burden to work on free labor. He never, he never gets there. But he provides in his will uh, for the education and the occupation of everyone who works at plantation, uh, and for the, those who were too old to do sick to work at that point. But then, since he realized that he was um, diminishing the um, monetary value of his estate, he didn't have a son, as we know, he had five nephews, and he said, they're all going to be the executor of the will, we're going to have nice checks and balances, and four of them are going to clobber the one who seeks to obey my wishes, basically. That's right, he will. Not the not lover. So I yield back. But you know, he, he was the wisest one, the least educated, probably the Let's wisest one of them all. Let's get some other voices in here. A man with a microphone. I'd like to return to the question of justice, which is what you were talking about. And with respect to one point you made in particular in connection with the founding fathers, 
that came in two different ways, but you talked about might makes right. And at the time of the founding of the Republic, we had kings and queens, and that was might which made right. And our founding fathers realized that they were not going to have that kind of a system, and so they created a republic. And the republic was founded on checks and balances, which meant that while the majority would eventually be able to implement its policies, first it had to go through a series of checks and balances, whether it's the Congress passing a law, the executive vetoing it, or what have you. Today in our system, we have some people who are questioning that kind of a system because they feel that to have debate, as Mr. Manchin is forcing, creates a slowing down of achieving things. And so if the majority is in favor of it, it should be adopted. And where do you draw the line between majority rule and justice for the minority? And if it that's a great question. Let me point out, for example, that Plato say that again. and Socrates are both citizens of Athens. Can you reframe it a little bit more? Excuse me. Uh, I was just focusing on the difference between majority rule and. Here we go. What is the difference between majority rule, which we all think is the right thing, and might versus right? And if we don't think, well, at some point we have to. But before we get to the point where it has to, we've, in our system at least, incorporated checks and balances that protect the minority as well so that they could be heard. And then the society decides the issue. So here, if we're not in favor of might versus right, and we are in favor of having checks and balances, why are we so upset when the system that was designed to provide that creates gridlock? The answer is, we're in the majority, we have the might, we must be right, therefore we don't want debate. And I just throw it out as a question of when do you reach the point, the tipping point? Let me point out that Socrates and Plato were no friends of democracy, although they lived in the world's first one. That is to say, they were citizens of Athens. And both were, were very, very dis disappointed and unhappy with democracy because they found it unjust. Because remember, for Plato, the, the, the people in charge are the people of intellect. And of course, the people in Athens who were in charge are the majority of the moment. They had none of the checks and balances of the American democracy. It was pure democracy. 5,000 people stood in the hill and they counted hands. And you know, when you got to 2,501, that's the side that won. And 10 days from now, it might be just the opposite, and so on. And in fact, one of the things that put them off was the instability. But for Plato, the people with the intellect weren't in charge. And, you know, smart people go through this all the time, right? If, if I'm smart and that person is dumb as a rock, why do we get the same vote? Well, let me tell you my anti-democratic moment. We had a town meeting in my town of 6,000 people. And the issue was momentous. Are we going to allow a Lowe's to be built? <laughs> <laughs> this is what town governments do, folks. And I'm sitting next to a person whom I like, but regard as a village idiot. I like the village idiot. And the mayor got up and said, all right, everybody can speak for two minutes. And I thought, that is a right. I got something smart to say, he's got something dumb to say. <laughs> and then you go, wait a minute. You know, that's not, that's not what the American democracy is, and it's not what democracy is in general. And, and remembering that moment, you know, I, 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 I struggle hard with looking at democratic forms of government. After all, there are lots of democracies in the world. Some work fairly well, some don't, but the ones that work well aren't all like ours. And in fact, they're in some ways very different. So what I, what I want to do to get back to what my theme is, because I have, I have very little to say about what some of you folks know a lot more about than I do. 
is this, that when we are trying to figure things out, how to understand the world we live in, how we would like to see it change, how, how we could go about influencing people to our views, it is good to remember, going back to our founding fathers, that they were people blending together really three things to make our Constitution. One was the Greek and Roman philosophers. They really did know their Plato. They really did know their Cicero and so on. The Bible. And of course, the British parliamentary system, which evolved in the 14th century in England. And they are trying to say, trying to create a just society, in, right? Establish justice. They're saying, what can we take from those three traditions and bring together in a way that will make what we have better than any one of those three, all of which have their virtues and their shortcomings. And I think that's what I'm urging you folks to do, to say to take your own experience, your own learning, your own travels, your own reading, your own participation in government, and say, what can we do to move toward a more just world? And we can argue about it, that's what Plato did, and we may not be able to come up with a formula that works, but the discussion itself leads us, I think, even if they're baby steps, toward something that's a bit more just. The, the founding fathers didn't get it exactly right. I think probably they'd have been the first ones to admit that. Again, how do you take Greek philosophy, the Bible, and what those Brits did 700 years ago, well, now, in England, all different things with different purposes and blend them together into a document that's that thick. All right? Well, it's been amended now close to 30 times. And not bad for 200 and some years, and of course it's difficult to amend. But the point is, we, we continue to try to struggle, and we add new ingredients. We just know a lot of stuff people didn't know back then. We've had a lot of geniuses between the time those guys died and we're alive. You know, whether it's Alexis de Tocqueville on democracy or Frederick Douglass on slavery or whatever it is, we got a lot of smart people in between that we can draw on. That we may not draw exactly the same conclusions any of the founding fathers did. But what we got to do is struggle and think and talk and argue civilly and see if we can't get a little bit closer to what our founding fathers said we have to do, which is to establish justice in a way that I think implies, and that, that can lead to domestic tranquility, having a common defense, promoting the general welfare, and securing the blessings of liberty. So what we do here, and what you do when you go home and, and get a book or read the, read the newspaper today, is just you know a drop in the, in the ocean. And that's what we all can do. And then our drop can get a little more significant. We talk to other people and write, or whatever else we do. But I think we ought to say, asking ourselves what justice is and how we practice it is about as important as anything we should be asking for ourselves, and I'm looking at, at people our age, and our grandchildren. That's a pretty important task, and we can all be part of that dialogue, thoughtful dialogue. A little bit of reading, a little bit of thinking, a little bit of discussing, maybe a little bit of red wine. <laughs> We don't, it doesn't have to be boring. Socrates is swelling away when he's talking uh, at this party. You know, we, don't want to, we don't want to put that aside. So that, that's what I'm sort of urging by giving an example of, of sort of a simplified, we got this and we got this, and somehow or other we need to find ways to reconcile, if not reconcile, at least to talk about them both and practice them both, knowing that both theory and practice are important. Thank you. That's great.